And um, he was the guy that, um, that people zeroed in on and, and really got the press and, and so forth. But there was, a, there was a, a three star general that was involved in that war. And I won't even tell you his name because it's immaterial. But that three star general, his purpose and his function in that war was to provide the logistical support that General Schwarzkopf needed in order to pull that operation off. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have some Army chaplains here uh, with us this morning or uh, this afternoon. And um, if I'm not mistaken, that, that gentleman just picked up a fourth star, I believe, last year. He didn't pick up a fourth star. He retired. Okay. But if you were to talk to Norman Schwarzkopf and ask him who was the one person that was probably the most important person to him during the Gulf War, he had pointed to that, that one man because that guy amassed all the material. He arranged for all the personnel that were necessary, all the armaments, all the tanks, planes, everything that were, were necessary, missiles and all of those things, all of the supplies, food and ammunition and, and all of those kinds of things and uh, the logistics that went into that thing. Uh, we were months in getting the logistical things in place before that war actually was launched. And that's one of the reasons it uh, was over so quickly. One of the reasons the Second World War lasted as long as it did was because we did not have the logistics to support a war of that magnitude. We were, uh, we were uh, brought into the war without expecting to be in the war at that particular time. And so we had to gradually build up our logistics. And so what happened here at Brownsville was this. Uh, we were caught much like um, the, uh, the American Navy at Pearl Harbor during the Second World War. We were unprepared for what happened. God just ambushed us. You know, we sing, He touched me, He touched me, and now we've learned to sing, He mugged me, He mugged me. Uh, you know, because God is doing things that just absolutely amaze amazes us and we're unprepared for those things and so what happened to this church was that uh, the church was not really geared up for this kind of a revival and um, and so the logistics were not here now the church was doing good it was an average run-of-the-mill dead assembly of God church um, and um, very well organized and so forth but then revival hit and what happened when revival hit was the infrastructure of this church was absolutely destroyed and uh, it was destroyed for two, two reasons. Uh, part of those folks that were instrumental or very important to the infrastructure were so overwhelmed by revival until they were offended and left, and others um, were so taken by the revival and, and they got so enamored with what was going on until they forgot that they had responsibilities. And um, the church began to grow immediately, just like that. I got here the second Sunday night of the revival. And I walked through those doors over there, sat down over here. It's crazy stuff going on. I've never seen it in my life. I didn't know Steve Hill, didn't know Lyndall Cooley. I knew John Kilpatrick because I'd been stationed here my last tour in the Navy. Uh, for three and a half years, I was stationed here, preached in this church many times. And, um, and we were close friends with John and Brenda, and they came to my retirement and all of this. And then we went to Georgia for eight years to pastor. And, and I thought I was retiring, came back here, walked into the church the second Sunday night of the revival, had resigned my church, sat down over here, all this crazy stuff going on. And I said to my wife, God, John's going to stop this. Because as John mentioned the other night, he was a controller. And, um, you know, always in control. And um, I, I didn't know Steve or Lyndall. And, and so I said to my wife, where is John anyway? And she said, well, I think that's him laying in the orchestra pit up there. <laughs> and... Um, in those days, right behind this banister right here, we had an orchestra pit there. And so what would happen is John would walk in and fall out, and they'd take him throw him over in the orchestra pit. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, Steve Hill and Lyndall Cooley were driving the ship, and I didn't know either one of them. And, and um, I don't basically trust people that act flaky that I don't know. <laughs> and in fact, I don't trust anybody that acts flaky, even if I do know them. And uh, I didn't know either one of these guys. And Steve was an absolute wild man. And Lyndall had long hair in those days. And he'd look at the ceiling at those lights up there with his eyes crossed and write songs. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I didn't like his long hair or anything else. I mean, he was driving me nuts. And uh, so, um, so um, <laughs> God, God touched me in that, uh, in that revival. And the thing, 
um, was growing, and so John called me one day, and, and I was in another state, another city, in a hotel, preaching a 20-week revival, a 26-week revival in a Baptist church, and the uh, power of God was coming down because God had changed my life, and I'd gotten accustomed to all this crazy stuff that goes on in revival, and then it was happening to me, and so I really understood it better then, and uh, he said, we've got to have some help down here. This thing's gotten too big, so I, I need for you to, um, to come and help me, and um, I, I didn't want to do this because uh, when I left um, the church in Albany, Georgia, uh, I was 62 years old, and I, I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Pensacola. I'm going to build me a house on the golf course, and I'm just going to play golf the rest of my life. Just suffer for Jesus, bless God. And, um, you know, and that's what I wanted to do. And then, then I got involved in this evangelism, and, um, and uh, hey, evangelists have it made. I'm telling you, if you, if you pastors have never tried it, you'll, I highly recommend it. I mean, if you can get away with it, do it. And so I started doing this evangelism stuff. You know, it's wonderful. You just blow in, blow up, and blow out, man. And, um, you know, if there are any problems, just tell them to see the pastor, and you go back to the hotel and go to sleep. And, um, and I didn't want to get back in pastoral work. And, you know, I gave John, when he asked me about coming on as his assistant, I, I gave him the class, classical Pentecostal answer when you don't want to do something. I'll pray about it. And he looked at me with those furred eyebrows that uh, Lyndall was describing a moment ago, and he said, I've already prayed. <laughs> and I said, well, you don't mind if I do. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I, that's how I came here. And, 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 and when I came, I expected to be his assistant. And here's what happened. He, he took me in his office over there, and he said, this is going to be your office. And I'm thinking, my office, where's yours going to be? And uh, he said, these are the keys. And he said, there's a parking place out front that says, Pastor, and that's yours. And he said, here's a telephone number. Call me. And he walked out. And he hasn't been back. <laughs> except to come to church. And um, so I have, a, I have a cell phone that, uh, that I can get in touch with him anytime. And, you know, so uh, he's the man. And make no mistakes about it. He is the man. And, um, you know, everything is done by him. But my job is the daily operation of the church. It's the logistics of the church. That's my job. Now, you know, we have two staffs. We have a revival staff and a church staff. And some of us serve on both. And I, I serve on both. And, um, but my main concentration here, my main responsibility is the church. He said, you take care of this church. Put it together. And you, you operate this church. And uh, so I said, well, okay. And I, 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 I really didn't know what to do. You see, we were having, uh, I was seeing the Great Commission fulfilled in front of my very eyes. I, you know, when I got here, um, the, the place was not packed. You could find, you could get here at 7 o'clock and find a seat almost anywhere in the balcony or the main floor. But then uh, by this, the fall of, uh, of 96 and the beginning of 97, this place became a madhouse. There were people everywhere. It was like a zoo, and, uh, uh, you know, just people everywhere, and, and stuff to do. And I got on my face over in the office, and I began to say, Lord, you know, we, we're doing this great commission. The whole world is coming here. I think there are 140 nations of the world have visited us here so far. And, uh, of course, you know the great commission in, in Matthew 28 19 and 19 uh, and 20, uh, going to all the world. Uh, and make disciples, uh, and baptize, and, and uh, those kinds of things. And, and, and so we were doing that. Uh, although I must tell you that um, we're, we're not really smart around here. People come here all the time to learn about revival, learn how to do revival. They're going to come here and take notes and, and from us, and they're going to learn to do revival. Let me, can I tell you something? We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> That's the honest God truth. We don't know. You know. Let me tell you how baptisms came about. We tell converts when they come here to get in a good Bible-believing church, uh, get rid of their, their um, hang-ups, their pornography and all that stuff, and, um, and get baptized. And, um, and so one of these new converts walked up to us, one of us, somebody here, and said, you folks tell us to be baptized, but you never baptize anybody. Why? Duh. Well, you know. And that's why we started baptizing people. And I'm telling you, we don't know what we're doing out of the mouth of babes and and you know two-thirds of what we do here we uh, somebody else has, has suggested or told us that you know why don't you try this and and um, so 
you know, we don't know what we're doing. And, and so these people were coming in here and people were getting saved, people were coming to the church and we really didn't have a plan. We didn't have the logistical support we needed to, uh, to take care of this because, um, you see, we were having a lot of converts. We were doing the one, uh, the Acts 1, uh, 1, 7 and 8 deal, you know. Uh, you shall receive power to witness. And, um, and, and so we were, we were making a powerful witness. And we were making a lot of converts, but we were not made, turning out disciples. And um, we, we were not equipped to do that. We, we were just overwhelmed and inundated with numbers of people. And, um, you know, many of you, you think you want revival, but I'm going to tell you when revival gets there, you're not going to want it. First of all, it's not going to look like what you think it ought to look like. And number two, you're going to get every nut and flake within 40 states on either side of you. And, and, and these are time-consuming people. I mean, you've got to wade through some stuff with these folks, you know. Bright lights draws bugs. And the brighter the light, the bigger the bugs. And um, so we had all these bugs coming in here, you know, and I'm, I'm not speaking down at these folks. They have genuine problems, but they can be a problem too, especially when you're a task-oriented person like me, you know. Uh, I want, I, you know, I get a goal, and I want to, I want to, I want to meet that goal. I want to get this task done. And these um, these high maintenance people come in, and and they interfere with you doing that. And um, so, you know, I, I wanted to get some discipling done. And uh, you know, we were we were witnessing, and yet we were we were not really reaching Pensacola. And I, I believe that there there is a great tension in the church today about evangelism and discipleship. And I believe that in the minds of people, it's an either-or situation when it should be a both-and. Because, you see, you cannot disciple someone who is not saved. I think the church has been trying to do that for the last 25 years. And as a result, we've got a lot of people in our churches that know a lot of religious vocabulary. They know a lot of religious organization. They know a lot of Scripture, but they don't know Jesus. And so, you know, it seems to me the first thing we've got to do is get them converted. And we were doing a great job at conversion, but we were not doing a good job at discipleship. And um, we were doing a good job at going into all the world and preaching the gospel. And the reason we were able to do that wasn't because, it wasn't because we were going out there, but the world's coming to us. And so when I got here and I began to look at this this uh, conglomeration of stuff that we had. And, of course, P uh, Pastor was so overwhelmed by this thing and, and just inundated. People were demanding he write books. They come here and he comes here and speaks. He goes there and speaks. And he doesn't fly, so he's having to drive. And, um, and, and driving consumes a lot of time. And, uh, you know, he said, um, I have biblical grounds for not flying. The Scripture says, Lo, I'm with you always. And... Um, <laughs> And I told him, I said, John Kilpatrick, why don't you fly? If you would fly, you would have more energy. You could be here to help me and more. And, um, and uh, you know, um, it would just be better for everybody. And he said, I'm not flying. I almost had him convinced one time. And then um, Steve and Lyndall and uh, the worship team got on a uh, chartered aircraft and went to Grand Rapids to do a meeting up there. And the pastor drove. Well, on the way back, they hit a line of thunderstorms and were forced down up north of here someplace and pastor got here before they did and they almost got killed in the airplane and that sealed it I mean you know pastor said I ain't gonna do it I'll tell you how close he came he bought a book on flying <laughs> he did came in the office one day to uh, for something and he had this book on his I said what's, what's the book there because I'm always interested in what he's reading and he said oh there's a book on flying I said oh, do you really believe you can read that book and take over that thing if anything happens See, he was, he was and, and then after that happened uh, with Lendl and them, there's no way. So I told him this. I said, you know how you're going to die? You're going to be driving down the road in your bus, and I'm going to be in an airplane going someplace, and the airplane's going to crash into your bus. <laughs> but anyway, we're trying to sort out here how we're going to take these converts and turn them into... Uh, uh, to uh, disciples and and how we were going to do our Jerusalem 
because at this point in time, by now, we're reaching the world, but we're not reaching Pensacola. And so I, 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 I was just on my face, and I was in a panic about this, the logistics of this thing, because I knew if we didn't get the logistics together, we were not going to preserve the harvest. That simple. You know, it's one thing to gather the harvest out of the field. It's another thing to preserve the harvest. And uh, we were doing a great job of gathering, but we were not doing a great job of preserving. And um, so I, I, I began to, uh, to search the Scriptures to see how I could synthesize th these two Scriptures of witnessing in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth and going into all the world and making disciples. And, and I, I, I believe that there's that tension between people that says, well, you either got to make a choice, make disciples or do soul winning. And um, uh, I, I don't think it has to be an either or. I think it can be, it can be synthesized. Those two, I, it must be, as a matter of fact. And um, so um, uh, that is, is the basis by which we begin to uh, develop the strategy by which we were going to, um, uh, to carry out the ministry of this church. And so the strategy to fulfill our responsibility to minister at our Jerusalem, first of all, began, and I'm on page 59 in your book right now, began with uh, uh, strategy number one, intercessory warfare prayer over the city. Uh, I, I seem to sense in my spirit that if we were going to be able to touch this city, and if this church was going to function as it needed to function, we were going to have to attack uh, the strong man over the city, or the strong men over the city. And I basically determined that there were uh, two or three, uh, the, basically three strong men over this city. One was homosexuality. Pensacola had, has come to be known as the homosexual Riviera. And uh, number two, abortion. Uh, this is the city in which the abortion clinic bombings took place and the murder of abortion doctors took place. and. And it was becoming very, a, a very violent type of a confrontation, not only for the, the murder of the babies in the abortion clinics, but the murders of the doctors and the bodyguards and those kinds of things. And the third thing was a religious spirit. Now, I don't know what the strong men may be over your cities, but I'm going to tell you one of them invariably is going to be a religious spirit. You might as well make up your mind you're going to have to take this booger on no matter what else is there, you're going to have to take this particular spirit on. And the religious spirit is probably the most insidious of all of these spirits. Let me tell you, a homosexual knows, they know they're a homosexual. One of the reasons they're so arrogant is because they know that what they're doing is so perverted. That's one of the reasons. And there isn't a person with a medical degree that will tell you that abortion is nothing less than murder. They know what they are doing. But a religious spirit is so camouflaged behind looking good, smelling good, uh, talking good, acting good, until you, you, you just have a difficulty getting at this critter. Billy Graham once observed, and I'm sure you've heard this quote, that the average American has been an inoculated with just enough religion to make them immune from the real thing. And, um, and it's right on target. And so we, we uh, I sent out a hundred letters to, uh, to pastors in this area. And I told them the burden of our heart, that we were not here just to build Brownsville Assembly, that we wanted to build the kingdom of God and we wanted to bring this city to God for the kingdom. And invited them to a meeting whereby we would strategize how to pull down these strong men over the city. We had 20, 20 churches represented in the initial meeting. And uh, so we told them in two weeks we'll meet again and uh, in that meeting two weeks from now, we will form a steering committee and we will strategize as to how we can go about uh, being united in prayer to pull down the strongholds over the city. Two weeks later, we met. We had 26 churches represented and um, we formed the steering committee, uh, which was chaired at that point in time by a United Methodist pastor and uh, now is chaired by Lila Trahune, who is the head of our intercessory department here at the church. And um, so we have been praying over the city for the last, uh, about the last two and a half years, intensive, uh, intensively praying over the city. Once a month, uh, this United in Prayer group meet at a strategic place somewhere in the city, and uh, it moves from church to church, different churches, and uh, they pray 
uh, for Pensacola and to break these strongholds over this area. We now have over 50 churches involved in, in what we're doing, and more are coming on board all the time. And uh, it is our goal eventually to have every church in Pensacola to meet with us once a month. Now, that's in addition to other intercessory prayers that are going on. For instance, uh, that's in addition to what we do here. We have intercessory prayer every Tuesday night here in the church and have had for, since two and a half years before revival began. And um, then uh, we also have an intercessory prayer group that meets every afternoon at 4.30 before revival meetings, and they pray all the way through the revival services that night. Some of them come in here and pray and sit in the congregation and pray. Others are on their face in the intercessory prayer room. Uh, so we do intercessory prayer. Other churches do intercessory prayer, but this united in prayer is in addition to what the individual churches are doing. And um, we're beginning now to see uh, the results of this prayer. Every Friday and Saturday night, we send out witnessing teams from the church here in the school. About 400, 400 people are involved in that. And they're seeing more conversions now than they've, uh, on the streets of Pensacola than they've ever seen in the history of their witnessing. And we believe that that is attributable to the fact that we are pulling down these strongholds and opening up Pensacola to the receptivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, so we're, we're thrilled about that. And uh, we believe that other churches are coming on, that few, few are added uh, uh, periodically. And um, so... Uh, we're going to do a prayer crusade down in the, uh, in the, um, the Civic Center uh, in the near future. And we believe that that's going to draw many, many more churches together with us. And so uh, we, th that's the first thing we are beginning to do. I would like to say, suggest this to you. And by the way, don't take anything that I'm uh, saying to you today uh, as fact that we have arrived and we know what to do and you don't, and so we're going to teach you. That's not my purpose and that's certainly not my heart. I said a moment ago, we really don't know what we're doing, and that's the honest to God truth. We're feeling our way along just like you're feeling your way along, and we're trying to find the mind and heart and will of God just like you are. And sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. But um, and so I'm not trying to, to elevate us above you, but I'm, I would like to suggest this to you, that if you want to see revival come to your area, I believe that one of the things that is going to be absolutely necessary is for some kind of a unity to begin to develop between the different faith groups in that community. As long as the church opposes itself, the church is not going to be a conquering church. Jesus himself said this, a kingdom divided against itself will fall. And one of the reasons we have not evangelized the world is because we've been defending our own personal territory. And what we need to do is to give up some of these uh, minor skirmishes over some minor theological uh, differences, and we need to, to understand that the, if, if somebody claims the blood of Jesus Christ as their redemption, then we need to call them brother or sister. So consequently, we have had United Methodist pastors baptized in that baptismal pool by immersion. They've come here and they've, they've gone up and gotten in the pool and immersed people because they just did not want to be disassociated from the rest of the body of Christ over the mode of baptism. Now, we happen to believe that, uh, that the mode is immersion. That's what we do here. But, you know, I'm not going to get in a gunfight with the United Methodists that sprinkles. I'm just not going to do it. If, if they accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, bless God, I'm going to call them a brother or sister. Because as I understand baptism, it's not a requirement for salvation anyway. It's something we ought to do in obedience to God because we're saved, not something we do in order to be saved. But you see, if the devil can get us to zero in on some, some, uh, some, something like that, then it, uh, hell can keep us divided. And when we're divided, we're not praying prayers that penetrate the darkness. Does that make sense? Okay. So, I, I would just encourage you to consider doing that. And uh, you'd be surprised, you know. Um, tonight when you're prayed for, or tomorrow night when you're prayed for, you may have a Methodist or a Baptist or an Episcopalian, God forbid, laying hands on you, huh? <laughs> and, and, you know, we don't pin a tag on them and say, you are now going to be prayed for by an Episcopalian. Act accordingly. 
They all have a prayer team badge on them. We don't make a distinction between one flavor or another, okay? These people have been screened very, very carefully about their spiritual life, and, uh, and uh, they're walking with God, and that's all we want. We don't care what denominational tag they have on. Tell you about denominational tags. They're either going to fall off when we rise or they're going to burn off when we go down. And so the sooner we get rid of them, the better off we will all be. So that's the first strategy in this warfare. Uh, the second strategy is community outreach. And interestingly enough, uh, the way I have these listed here is not necessarily the order in which they came to us and, and the way we developed them. As a matter of fact, uh, community outreach is the last of the strategies that we developed. In fact, we're still right now in the developmental phase of community outreach. And uh, Bob March, come up here just a minute if you would please. Uh, this is Bob March. Bob is um, a graduate of ORU. Uh, he is a graduate of our School of Ministry at Brownsville. Um, you say, didn't ORU educate him? Yes, ORU educated him, but we wanted to inoculate him. And so we shot some stuff into him through two years of our school here that he'll never recover from. And, um, and so Bob has, um, has a background uh, in, in administrative skills that we needed for this particular thing. And so we understood that we needed to reach into this community and touch this community not only in a spiritual way, but in other ways as well. Now, this church has always ministered to this area. We elected to stay in the Brownsville area rather than vacate to the suburbs. Just have a seat there, Bob. Bob's been fasting. He's a little weak, and so I'll just let him sit there. Um, I want you to see him. Um, so uh, we, we didn't vacate to the suburbs. We decided to stay here, and as you can see, we've made a sizable investment here in this area. And... Um, it's amazing in an economically devastated area like this how property has escalated over the last five years. Um, you know, we, when we started uh, buying property here, we would have it assessed and, um, or we, we would have an, an, an estimate done on it, an appraisal, and then we would give the property owner $3,000 more than what it appraised for because we wanted the community to know that we were not trying to take advantage of anyone. And um, lo and behold, every time we buy a piece of property, it invariably appraises for more because the last piece that sold C uh, went up, and, and so it, it just continues to escalate. And now this little blue house is sitting right over here behind the Family Life Center. It's the only house sitting on that corner there that uh, doesn't belong to us. We own the rest of that block. The, the brick house over there is our distribution center. But that little blue house over there is worth about... Uh, maybe twenty thousand dollars, but it now has a price tag on it of seventy-two thousand, and so we're going to let the termites have an expensive meal. We're not paying that for that building, and um, we'll let the termites eat it down. But um, uh, we wanted to stay here and penetrate this particular area of the city, and so we we were going out and sending teams out. And they were going block by block, street by street, uh, house by house, and knocking on doors. And, and they would go two by twos, and, and uh, this is the way they were doing it. They'd say, hello, we're from Brownsville uh, Assembly, and we just want to let you know that, um, that we love you, and we love our neighborhood, and we're here uh, to, say, to uh, pray for you. And so uh, we wonder if you have any prayer needs, and they'd take the prayer needs, and then they'd give the, the household a ticket to get in revival and say, you know, there's a crowd of people out there and we'd like to give you a ticket so that you don't have to stand in line. So uh, you just take this ticket and bring it to the door and show it to an usher and they'll let you come in as our special guest. And so if you ever come here and, and you stand in line for 12 hours to get in, which is possible in, in the summer, um, and you come in, the church is half full, don't get ticked off. Because you see, those people that are in here are people we've given tickets to. They're our special guests. But let me tell you how to get around standing in line if you ever come here and you don't want to stand in line. Just go out here on the street and find you a heathen and bring him to the door, knock on the door, and when the usher comes, say, this is a heathen. And the usher will let you right in with your heathen. That's the honest to God truth, I promise you. The usher will say, you got a heathen? Come on in. Now listen, don't get one of your friends and bring him up and say, this is a heathen. Our ushers are discerning people. They can tell a heathen when they see one. Okay? 
So um, if you don't want to stand in line, just go get a heathen and bring them up here and knock on the door and the usher will let you in with your heathen. And that's why the church is about two-thirds full sometimes when you stand in line and, and, and you come in because these are our special guests. These are people we're trying to win to God. And, you know, you're already one to God, so you can go sit in, uh, sit in the overflow over there. We need these people in here so that uh, we can get them right under Steve's spit. <laughs> and... Um, so, uh, you know, we were doing that, and uh, we were having phenomenal results. But then we became aware that, um, <clears throat> and we were doing clothing and dis uh, food distribution. But then we became aware that the, the, the government, the federal, state, local government, has suddenly come, and come to the realization that you cannot throw money at social problems and fix them. And so they're turning more and more to faith-based initiatives. And so we're in an area of the county called Track 19. And uh, the, the government sanctioned this study on four tracks in the greater Pensacola area, three of them in the city limits, this one in the county. We're in the county. And uh, this happens to be Track 19. And they identified the needs and demographics of those areas and they identified the major players in those areas. And guess what the, the government came up with? They said the major players in Track 19 called Brownsville are these, Baptist Hospital, Baptist, Salvation Army, and Brownsville Assembly of God Church. Those were the three major players identified with public funds that were, were spent to do this study. They identified three religious entities and we were one of them. Well, we wanted to expand our horizons anyway, and so we got a hold of this, this piece of information through one of the ladies in our church that happens to know about those kinds of things. She just happens to know about those kinds of things. And so we went to the county, and we said, you got a problem. You got a quarter of a million dollars that you need to spend, and if you don't spend it, you're going to lose it. We have a plan. You got a problem, we got a plan. Our plan will solve your problem. Would you like to, let's cozy up here and see what we can do together? And so we approached them as if we were doing them a favor to spend their quarter million dollars. <laughs> we really did. Is that the truth, Bob? Yes, That's the honest God truth. And you know what? They gave us a quarter of a million dollars. And so we're buying a building over here on Mobile Highway. This is a red uh, uh, building over here that uh, it was a furniture store at one time. We're buying that, and we're opening a resource and outreach center there. And um, uh, the, the, another entity here in town, state entity, uh, just gave us a computer system, a network of computers that we can now teach people computer skills. We can teach GED testings. We can teach people how to dress. We can give them some clothes to dress with. We can teach them how to put on makeup and how to take a bath. And we can teach them uh, uh, how to job interview, how to write resumes. Uh, we, a Baptist Hospital is going to have nurses over there and, and, and so forth in our facility. And they'll do screenings. And uh, uh, so God is just opening this whole thing up in a way that we could hardly imagine. And, of course, uh, the results of this particular initiative or strategy or uh, attempt at warfare, if you want to, call it that, is that uh, we're reaching the community and we're already forming cell groups in this area. Now, I'm going to tell you, my, my goal is to put a cell group in every, every city block in Pensacola. That's my goal. And you say, that'll never happen. Well, maybe it won't, but it's a good target to shoot at. You know, most of us do, do church work like this. We're like the little country boy who invited his city slicker friend to come home with him for a weekend. And as they drove into the farmyard, the little city boy said to his, his country friend, said, man, said, I didn't know you were as good with a bow and arrow as you are. Said, look at that. There are bullseyes over there, and in, in the middle of every one of those bullseyes, there's an arrow. And the little country boy said, I, I'm not good with a bow and arrow. In fact, I can barely hit the side of the barn. And the little city boy said, but every one of those arrows are right in the middle of that bullseye little country boy said, yeah, this is what I do. I shoot at the barn, and wherever the arrow hits, I paint a bullseye around it. <laughs> and that's a lot of the way we do church work. We just haul off and shoot out there someplace, and wherever the arrow hits, we paint a bullseye around it so we feel good. But we've decided to establish a target 
And if we don't hit right in the bullseye, if we hit one of the outer rings, that's okay. At least we hit the target. And so the target is this. We're going to put a cell group in every city block in Pensacola, Florida. And you say, All right, do you really believe you're going to do that? Well, I really believe I'm going to do it. I really believe we're going to do it. Uh, you know, it's going to take a little time, but I really believe we're going to do it. And I'll talk about cells in a minute and show you some of the progress that we, we've made. Uh, in addition to uh, reaching the community with food and clothes and formation of cell groups, uh, we are now, right now, we make the payments and we supplement a feeding program for an Afro-American church uh, located up W Street by near Catholic High School. We make their mortgage payment and we give them money to subsidize their feeding program up there. And... Um, we send teams up there to work on their property, to improve that property. It's in one of the roughest areas of Pensacola. In fact, the pastor was a drug dealer that was shot down within three blocks of where that church is located. He was shot down there some years ago in a drug deal. And he got saved, and God called him into the ministry, and now he's pastoring that church. We feel like if a guy will go back into that kind of an environment, we ought to help him. And so we're making his mortgage payments and supplementing his feeding program. <laughs> There's some other things that are in the, in the plans that, um, that I, I, I'm not at liberty to talk about, but the guy that drives this thing is this man, Bob Martz, you see. Uh, God put the vision in my heart, but he put the muscle in Bob Martz and put the brains in his head along with a, a girl in our church by the name of Tamla Ramos. Tamla was a Catholic when this revival started, and God saved her. And God saved her for the specific purpose of helping us to take the riches of the wicked and store them up for the, the blessing and the ministry of the righteous. And so Tamla is a tremendous resource to us because she knows all of the ins and outs and she knows everybody in Pensacola and she knows how she's a little bitty girl but she can twist arms better than anybody I've ever met. And so she teams up with Bob and they're, they're getting our community outreach going and I'm going to tell you that we're going to take Pensacola. We're going to take Pensacola. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bob. Praise God. Praise God. Now, the third strategy... Oops, I've sprung a leak here. That is so embarrassing. Y'all better be glad I dropped that mic or you would have been grossed out. I don't know what happened to me, but last night something just... Uh, crept over me as I was sleeping. The third strategy in, in our, our logistical warfare, the logistical side of this warfare, has to do with a thing called cleansing stream. Cleansing stream, uh, how many of you are familiar with cleansing stream? How many of you are not familiar with cleansing stream? Okay, good. I'm going to give you some handouts here in a minute, but uh, not going to give them out while I'm talking because you'll read them. Uh, while I'm talking, and it just ticks me off when people read when I'm talking. And so I'm not going to give you a copy of it until after I get finished talking, okay? But I want to tell you about cleansing stream because this is one of the strategies we use here in, in the uh, logistics that we use here in order to help people. You see, it's one thing to get people saved. It's another thing to get people discipled. It's another thing to get people cleaned up. Okay? And I, I know that there are those that are really nervous about the deliverance ministry. And, and rightfully so, because there have been so many flaky things that have gone on in the name of deliverance until um, it just scares the daylights out of most pastors. And uh, the second reason deliverance scares most pastors is because we don't know how to do it. And what we don't know how to do, we fear and reject. And because of the flakiness, we were rejected. But I want to tell you that deliverance is a very needed ministry in the church today. And so in order to, um, to do uh, deliverance without offending anybody, we don't use the term deliverance. We use the term cleansing or freedom. And if you're here today and you think 
that your people don't need cleansing or freedom, then you believe pigs roost in trees. Because I'm telling you right now, our people need cleansing, else why do we have the hell in our churches we have? Answer me that. You say, well, it's human nature. That's exactly the point. That's what we need deliverance from. That's what we need cleansing from. And that's why we need some type of a ministry that will help us deal with these strongholds and control points in people's lives. You say, now, do you believe that a Christian can be demon-possessed? No, I don't. But I know this. There are believers who have points of controls in their lives. And those controls are not godly controls. They are satanic controls. And so it's not a matter of possession. It's a matter of who controls certain areas of our lives. You can deny this all you want to. It's a reality. And, uh, you know, I can just, I, I could go to your church and I could be there for three nights of meetings, and I could point out to you uh, people, before those three nights of meetings were up, I could point out to you people in your church that needs freedom because there are certain strongholds in their lives. It's just like a, a hook in a fish's jaw. A hook in a fish's jaw will control that fish and make that fish go anywhere that hook will take. All the fish might fight it and pull out some drag line and, and so forth and, um, and those kind of things. But basically, the fish is hooked. And I'm going to tell you, we have hooks in our souls that hell uses to yank on. And the sooner we understand this and the sooner we get it out of our people, then the better off we're going to be. So I was up in Michigan doing a pastor's conference for a friend of mine with whom I'd gone to college and uh, he went to ORU and I went to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary for, um, for our, our further education and then I went in the Navy and, and um, he pastored in Tulsa and then went to Michigan. And the revival came and, uh, and I came on staff here and, and he invited me up to do a pastor's conference. He gathered some pastors in Michigan and, uh, and asked me to come up and talk to them about revival and I did. While I was there, he introduced me to Cleansing Stream. I'd never heard, it, heard of it before in my life. And so he gave me a leadership package, and I brought it back, and I began to look at it, and I thought, dear God, these people from California, you know, Californians are crazy anyway. Every one of them's running from something, and they, get, they run up against the Pacific Ocean, and they can't go any further, and so they just go nuts right out there on the coast. And... Um, and, and, you know, and, and this is from California, and I, I said to myself, I, I looked at that, and I said to my wife, I said, you know what those people in California, they took a series of sermons I did when I was in Albany, Georgia, pastoring, and they made this thing into this thing, and they're making a men off of it. And my wife said, she was studying it with me, you know, and she said, well, Carrie, it's in the Bible, and you don't own that. But so help me, I have two former staff members from my church in Albany, and they're, they're on staff here with me now. But um, um, I preached a series of six messages right down the line of cleansing string. And somebody out in California was smart enough to study the same thing in the Bible, and they were smart enough to put it together in a cleansing stream, and so now they have this wonderful ministry. And um, so I went to John Kilpatrick, and I said, uh, Pastor, you know, we need, to, we, we need cleansing stream in the church. And he said, what's cleansing stream? So I said, well, here's the material. You look at it. Tell me what you think. He looked at it. He said, this is good stuff. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to put the leaders of the church through cleansing stream. And he said, okay. So I got up here and announced that we were going to put all the leaders through cleansing stream. And when I did, hell jumped right up in my face, just like that, which indicated we needed cleansing stream. <laughs> And, um, I mean, we, we got 25 de de deacons, and, uh, and they were in leadership, you know, and they didn't like me. Boy, they didn't like me, and others didn't like me because, I mean, you know, we were in revival, and here I, was, here I am, I'm talking about taking their Sunday night now because, you know, way back in the revival, we discontinued Sunday night services because we're, and we were giving people that night off, and I'm telling them, you're coming Sunday nights now. And boy, they didn't like that. For 12 weeks, you're going to come Sunday nights. And so they started writing cards and letters to pastor on me. 
So he called me back there one night before service, and he said, hey, I'm getting cards and letters and telephone calls on you. And I said, yeah, I know what I am too. And uh, he said, what do you want to do? I said, what do you mean what I want to do? What do you want to do? You're the pastor. And he said, well, do you want to put up with this garbage? And I said, well, I want cleansing stream in the church. I want these leaders to go through cleansing stream. And he said, okay. So I just called them all together, and I said, folks, I'm not here to form a study committee. I'm not here to negotiate. I'm here to lay down an ultimatum. You're going through cleansing stream, and you're out of a job. And um, so obviously um, I had 196 disgruntled. Well, not all of them were. Bill, Bill Lutz over there, he was one of those demon, uh, deacons. And he's on our staff now. But um, he came along willingly. But um, uh, a lot of them didn't. And um, so we started with a bunch of unhappy campers. And six weeks into cleansing stream, those that opposed me came up and were hugging my neck and they were saying, Pastor, we're, we're sorry for what we did and what we said and the way we conducted ourselves. You know, this is the best thing that's happened to us since sliced bread. And, um, um, you know, it's made such a difference in our church. We put over half of our church through cleansing stream now and it's cut our counseling 50%. People know how to deal with their problems now. They got tools by which they can deal with their problems. You see, the reason most people come for counseling is because they don't know what to do. And if they know what to do, usually they can take care of themselves. You know, if you know how to kill a snake, you don't have to call somebody every time you see a snake. You just kill the snake, okay? And so that's what we taught them how to do is just kill their own snakes. And um, now it's a requirement when you do something in this church, you serve in any capacity, you go through cleansing stream. If you operate a television camera, you go through cleansing stream. If you're an usher, you go through cleansing stream. Come on staff, you go through cleansing stream. Play instruments, you go through cleansing stream. Sing in the choir, you go through cleansing stream. Custodian, go through cleansing stream. And um, it, it's, just, it's just impacted our church in such a positive way. And um, so I want to recommend this to you. Basically, cleansing stream uh, deals with four major areas. The first area Cleanse Extreme deals with is alignment. We believe that when a person is born again, they're born again spiritually. They're not born again in their soul. They're not born again in their body. The soul is made up of the mind, will, and emotions. And when you got saved, your IQ didn't go up 10 points. I promise you, if you were stupid before you got saved, chances are you're stupid now. Okay? And I'm going to tell you, and nothing happened to your body when you got saved. You know, I always wanted to be a six foot four hulk. That's what I always wanted to be. And I'm stuck in this five foot eight squatty body. And I ain't ever going to get any taller. In fact, I'm getting shorter and wider every year. And, and so nothing happened to my body. But I was born again spiritually, and I was born again at 21. And when I got born again, I was a happy heathen. I was not in a crisis. You know, most people, they were in a crisis. I hear Steve talk about his testimony. He was in, in the throes of, uh, of um, uh, what do you, tremors or uh, withdrawal symptoms or something. I didn't have no withdrawal symptoms, man. I was too happy going to hell to withdraw. It was just, you know, I was, I was having a blast. And, um, and I went to church one night and a guy told me about hell, and he explained it in such a way that I thought it'd be a drag to go there. And so I went down front and got saved. And uh, when I got saved, I mean, the, there was a spirit man in me that came alive that had been dead all those years, 21 years. I lived my life by fleshly appetites and what I thought, what I felt, and what I wanted. That's how I lived my life. And uh, so I got saved, and this little spirit man that was born again in me was thrown into this arena with two Goliaths called my soul and my body. And, and they were always beating that little old guy up, that little David, you know, that little David spirit, just beating the daylights out of him. He'd want to, you know, my spirit would want to serve God, and my old flesh would want to do something like I did the first 21 years of my life, or my mind would begin to think those same thoughts, or, or um, you know, I'd begin to feel some of the same emotions and, and so forth. And, and, um, and so until I got into that series of messages I told you I preached, I really didn't understand 
why my life was like it was. But when I got into that and I understood that I was a spiritual, spiritually born individual and that I had to be, uh, I had to be transformed by the renewing of my mind and the saving of my soul was a process called sanctification. And, um, uh, and, and I began to understand that and that's how I got free. And so cleansing stream in alignment says that if you will walk, walk in alignment, spirit, soul, and body, that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so what we do in alignment, we teach people, you get up in the morning and you line yourself up this way, body, line up with my soul, soul, line up with my spirit, spirit, line up with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and you will listen to no other spirit and you will obey no other word except the Word of God. Do you understand that's how we're living today? Now invariably I'll do that at whatever time I get up in the morning and I get to work and one of these guys come in and suddenly instead of being spirit, soul, and body, I'll go soul, spirit, body. Because one of them will tick me off or something like that, you know, and I'll I, just, I, just, <laughs> I can't believe you brought that over here. <laughs> I don't remember the occasion that uh, caused them to put that in my office, but I was in there one day. <laughs> It was one of those task-oriented moments, you know. <laughs> I can't believe you guys. <laughs> I'll tell you, you got to stay in alignment to live with them. Anyway, Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Everybody knows that scripture, but how do you do that? You know, knowing the Scripture and doing the Scripture is two different things. And the truth of the matter is that so many of us have been overwhelmed with our flesh and overwhelmed by, by our mind, will, and emotion for so long until, and, 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 and we've been out of alignment for so long, our will is so weak, we can't obey the Word of God. And so we have to retrain ourselves to obey the Word of God. And so that's what alignment's about. Consecration is the second phase of cleansing stream. In consecration, we teach people that there are three areas of their life that must be consecrated. Listen to me carefully. There are three areas of your life that absolutely have to be consecrated. Number one, the material area of your life. Stuff. The second is relationships. And the third is yourself. If those three things are consecrated in your life, then you can walk in alignment without too much difficulty. But if, there, if, the, if one of those is unconsecrated, you will find it difficult to walk in alignment. And so we teach our people here that to walk in, con, uh, to, to live their lives consecrated. We want them to consecrate their things. Now let me tell you something. When this revival started, the budget of this church was $1.6 million. This year, the budget of this church is $7 million. Do you know how that's paid? It's paid by the people that attend this church. The average visitor to revival gives $3. Our budget and, and, and the money that's needed to run this revival and pay these bills is astronomical. We can't depend on visitors to do this. Our, light, our electrical bill is $14,000 a month. Just the electrical bill. $14,000 a month. Another fourteen for the, uh, for the security out there. So you got tires on your car and the windows are not broken out when you get out there. Another twelve for uh, nursery care. We shampoo this carpet every month. And it's, uh, I think it's about $4,000 every time we do it. And you better be glad we do because your nose is going to end up in it. And I'm going to tell you, we got some old boys from Alabama that come down here and they raise cows. And they wear the same shoes down here that they go to feed the cows in. And your nose is going to be sticking in where they've been walking and you better be glad we shampoo these carpets because we've had almost four million people come through here. And it's just expensive. We had to buy property for parking lots and, and we had to build that building over there for overflow. $3.7 million dollars. 
Well, I'm going to tell you the way we do that. 80% of our people tithe. And the reason they tithe is because we teach them that we don't own anything. God doesn't just uh, own the 10%. God owns it all. You say, well, not in my case, brother. I'm a self-made man. You're no such thing. If God took his hands off you, you wouldn't have enough sense to tie your shoe, much less make a living. It's God that gives you the power to get wealth. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner we'll conse consecrate all this junk to God. You see, the clothes we have on aren't ours. They're God's. The cars we drive, they aren't ours. They're God's. The houses we live in, they aren't ours. They're God's. This church is not ours, it's God's. That's why our people will go sit in an overflow so visitors can come in and sit in this main sanctuary. And they're paying the bills. Our guys are paying the bills. And they don't resent doing that. But you see, when stuff don't matter to you anymore, then you can, you, you know, it's not giving up anything because it's not yours to be. You know, in order to give something up, you must have it first. And if you never had it to begin with, then you don't, and, and, and you lose it, you didn't give it up. And some, you know, one of the, the missionaries that was killed by the Aka Indians down in Central America put it like this. He said, a man is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. But you see, the modern, um, the modern Western church, we don't know anything about that. Everything is ours, me, my. We're a me-centered generation. I'm not talking about just babies. I'm talking about adults. And if you don't believe it, you go and listen to, the par you listen to the parking lot after the next service when you go home, and you'll find people evaluating what, about that service by whether they liked it or not. It's a me thing. They don't care whether God liked it or not as long as they liked it or didn't like it, you know. And uh, so it's a me mentality. So we got to get that out of them. And so we teach them consecration of stuff. We teach them consecration of relationships. Listen, friend, there is nobody on the face of this earth worth going to hell over. You hear that? You preachers are, you're, you're, uh, the devil puts, uh, puts tempta sexual temptations before you almost every year of your ministry, but I'm going to tell you there isn't a woman or a man on the face of this earth that's worth going to hell over. And so those relationships have to, be, have to be consecrated and they have to be kept consecrated. And then, then our own personal agendas, you know, what I want, how I feel, what I think. If you want to see how, how unspiritual people are in your church, go up and ask them, a question, ask them a question about anything relative to the church. And here's what they'll tell you. They'll say, either I feel or I think. Well, who gives a rip what you think? We want to find out what God thinks. It's God's opinion we're interested in, not your opinion. But you see, that's where we are, and that's the way we think. And until we get self-consecrated, then we're never going to walk in alignment. And if we do get in alignment, we can't stay in alignment. In fact, the vast majority of believers today walk like this, soul, spirit, body. They walk by what they think, what they feel, and what they choose rather than what the Word of God says. So we teach consecration. And then words. We teach people that words are carriers and words can curse and words can damage and words can hinder and words can destroy. And so we teach people how to break the curses that have been spoken over their lives by words. And then fourthly, we teach them about cleansing itself. And in cleansing, we teach them that when a person sins, they give a foothold to the devil at that point in their life. Wherever the sin is, that's where the foothold is. You see, the initial problem is the sin. And there's a second problem if that sin is not dealt with. And the second problem is the foothold or the stronghold or the control point that is established there. So you got two problems, and so you got to have two solutions. The first solution for the sin is repentance. You repent toward heaven for the sin. 
But the second solution for the stronghold is that you renounce its legal right to control your life and renounce that spirit to hell. And so during this time we teach people uh, to stay away from sin, that when they do sin, they, um, they give hell a stronghold, and then we teach them how to be cleansed through repentance and through renouncing and using the power in the name of Jesus and the power of the blood of Jesus to break the stronghold over their lives. And then we take them through a retreat, a weekend retreat. And uh, in this weekend retreat, uh, we teach them, uh, uh, we, we give them some certain teachings and then we bring them forward and we anoint them with oil and we actually do the deliverance at that point in time. And I'm telling you, there are people in this congregation that have been absolutely set free from controlling lifestyles and behavior patterns that have controlled their lives in a negative way for years and now they're, well, they're walking in absolute total freedom. And so I'm going to give you a handout here at the end of this, and it'll have a, an 800 number. If you're interested in Cleansing Stream, all you have to do is call that 800 number, and they'll tell you how to get your church enrolled in that. Let me say this. If you're here, last thing about Cleansing Stream, if you're here and you're not a pastor, you're a lay person, and you've, you know, you've, you've had your interest stirred in Cleansing Stream, do not get a leadership package and try to bootleg Cleansing Stream into your church without your, your pastor's knowledge. So I'm going to tell you why. The minute you start dealing with this particular subject, hell is going to come out of the woodworks against you, and you've got to have spiritual covering in order to be protected in the middle of this thing. This is real, honest-to-God warfare. It is a dead-end alley brawl. That's what it is. But boy, when you come out of that alley, you may be blooded, but you will be victorious. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so don't bootleg it in without your pastor's, uh, a pastor's knowledge and understanding. And so the third or the fourth and last uh, strategy of our warfare here is cell groups. We uh, dealt with the question cell-based or program-based church. And um, we finally concluded that for us, it was going to have to be a cell-based church. And um, I want to talk about that for a little bit because, uh, you know, people have told me, well, a cell-based church won't work in the United States. And... Um, so Dr. Cho was here in April of 90, 98, I believe it was. And it was arranged for me to play golf with him for two days. And uh, so I got on a golf cart with Dr. Cho. And um, I have to tell you, he's a wonderful man of God, but he cheats at golf. <laughs> he does. First shot he hit went down the fairway to the left side and went in a sand trap. We drove down there, and he walked over in the sand trap and picked up his ball and threw it out in the middle of the fairway. I said, whoa, Dr. Cho, you can't do that. And he said, Brother Robinson, I'm the pastor. And I said, well, you don't pastor the whole world, just a good portion of it. Put the ball back in the trap. <laughs> so he had, every time, you know, he's always, a, you know, he'd be talking, and he'd kick the ball out behind a tree and all that stuff, you know. Wonderful man of God, but he cheats. <laughs> and um, so I told Dr. Cho, I said, Dr. Cho, I'm, I'm researching um, all the information I can get to see about sales for our church because I'd already gone to John and uh, Kilpatrick and told him, I said, John, we, we can't get the people in our church anymore, so we're going to have to take the church to the people. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, sales. And he said, whoa, man. I said, that's a problem. He could see splits all over the place, you know. And I said, well, well, let me, you know, release me to go ahead and, and do the research and, and let's seriously think about this and let's pray about it because, you know, you've got a problem. You're going to have to build a 12,000-seat auditorium or you're going to have to go to six services a day or you're going to have to let me do sales. Well, when I said uh, to spend all that money to build that big auditorium. That was out, and I knew he wasn't going to preach six times on Sunday, and that was out, and so I knew I was just about home free. And uh, <clears throat> so 
I, I, I told Dr. Cho, I said, Dr. Cho, I'm trying to, um, to educate pastor on sales because we've got to go to sales. And, and I said, will they work in the United States? And he said, absolutely, Brother Robertson, they will work. He said, here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to get your structure in place before you ever launch your cell ministry. Know what you want to do, what it will look like, where you want it to go, and get the structure in place before you ever bring it up to your people. Because when you bring it up, they want to know what it's going to look like. And if you don't know what it's going to look like, then you're not going to be able to get them to do it. And so, number one, you design what your cell ministry will look like. Number two, you recruit good leaders. And he said, take your time about recruiting good leaders. And he said, listen. He said, don't be afraid to use women. He said, 20,000 of my cell group leaders are women. He said, why don't you Americans use women? And I said, because we're male chauvinist pigs. And he said, I can relate to that. He said, my wife was a good, submissive Korean wife until she started watching American television. <laughs> and so he said, don't be afraid to use women and, so, uh, and, 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 and recruit good leaders. He said, thirdly, you train those good leaders. Do not release them into the cell ministry without proper training. And he said, number four, you supervise those leaders. Supervise them. Do not leave them to themselves. They need structure. They need supervision. They need oversight. Just like we all need oversight, they need oversight. And number five, motivate your leaders. Keep your leaders motivated. And he said, if you will do this, he said, sales will work in this country. So what we did was we began to devise a year before we ever announced that we were going to do sales. Uh, I was doing organizational things. And uh, basically the way we, we devised our system was we divided the church up into five districts. Uh, district number one is to the east of us across the bay uh, all the way down to Destin which is about 50 miles to the east of us. Uh, two, three, and four districts are here in Pensacola proper, and District 5 is in Alabama from just across the Alabama line here all the way to Mobile. In fact, we have one cell group in Mississippi. And um, to the north, to uh, Bay Manette and, uh, and uh, Flomaton, Alabama. So we've got a huge geographical area here, and that's District 5. And um, so... Uh, then we, we decided we were going to hire staff. I took the 25 deacons and I took the five senior deacons and put one in each one of these districts. And then I took the 20 deacons and uh, made them zone leaders, four zone leaders in each one of the districts. And so you've got a pastor and, and so we've got a senior, a senior deacon and four deacons which we call zone leaders in each one of the five districts. And then I hired a staff of pastors, Pastor and I did. Uh, we had Randy Worrell. Randy, stand up over there. Stand up, Randy. Stand up, Randy. No. Come up here. This is Randy Worrell. Randy and I graduated from the same seminary in New Orleans, and Randy was trained in uh, uh, clinical pastoral education as a hospital chaplain, and he was on staff when, when the revival started and when I came here. And so we redid Randy's portfolio and Randy's uh, cell pastor of um, uh, District 2. And uh, then we hired two other guys, and Pastor let me hire two guys off my staff in Georgia, Gary Doherty. Gary, come up here. Uh, Gary Doherty, uh, he's the pastor of uh, District uh, 4. And uh, Gary was a heathen uh, when I met him. And God saved him under our ministry over in Georgia, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost, and we got him through uh, ministerial training and uh, he's ordained and pastored a church already and now he's on staff with us here and was on my staff there and then we got um, Newman Ty. Uh, Newman was a preacher and then he lost it and got all messed up and teaching school and everything and and then God uh, God blessed him and uh, and I 
I hit him in the head with rocks and enough until we got through and so we got him him reinstated and um, he was on our staff in Albany and uh, he has uh, two districts he has district one that I was telling you is way over this way and district five over there so he's schizophrenic <laughs> he has a divided personality and then then district three is Bill Lutz Bill uh, is a Yankee God bless him and um, he was one of our deacons, this guy was. Let me tell you about this guy. About 10 years ago or so, he, um, there was an accident in which his two-year-old child was killed. And through that, pastor won him to the Lord, him and his wife. And they've grown by leaps and bounds. And Bill was one of, uh, was one of our deacons, developed into one of our deacons. And now uh, he's credentialed and he's one of our pastors. And so these are the guys that uh, do the cell ministry. And they work with each one of them with, with deacon, a senior deacon and four deacons uh, that uh, help them to manage their districts. And um, let me just share with you uh, what's happened. We began our cell ministry in September of 1998. Is that right, guys? September of 98. We had uh, 20 cells, I think, then, less than 300 people in it. This past month, March report, we had 137 cells with 7,325 people in them just about 16 months. And so I'm telling you this, that this is the best thing that you can do for your church. And um, thank you, fellas. Let, let me just explain to you why I think this is the best thing. Yeah, they, they deserve a hand. Because these guys actually pastor the church. They do all the counseling, they do the weddings, they do the hospitalization uh, visits, they do the funerals, and, and all of that stuff, they, they do that. And um, uh, so, you know, I mean, they're, they're just Trojans. They work, you know, I can't tell you how much they work. But um, uh, let, me, let me tell you what the problem with the, the Western church is. You see, if, if I understand if I understand the church, the church was designed to be the family of God. Is that right? How many of you would agree the church ought to be the family of God? Okay. But let me, let me just show you the problem that we have. Look at the configuration of this church. Don't look at me, but just look at the configuration of this church right now. Look at it. In fact, put your eyes on a level from where you are right now. Look directly in front of you, and what do you see? You see the back of somebody's head. That's about as boring as it gets. Every once in a while, they'll turn their head and you get a profile shot, but that doesn't relieve the boredom too much. But you know, what, what, what does this thing look like to you? What does it look like? It's bleachers. And what are bleachers for? Spectators. What does that look like? It's a stage. What are stages for? Performances. And here's the Western church. The spectators will leave church and they will evaluate the service based on wh whether they liked or disliked what the performers did. And the performers will, will uh, evaluate the service by the response or lack thereof they got from the spectators. And friend, I want to tell you something. You cannot build family that way because God is left out of that kind of a scenario. You listen to your people when they leave church. They leave church and they say, well, boy, I like that, or I didn't like that song, or it was too cold in there, or blah, 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 you know, everything. They're talking about everything under the sun except God. The question that should be asked from there and here when we leave here was, oh, God, what did you think? Were you pleased or displeased? And if God was displeased, then we ought to get on our face and repent. And if he was pleased, we ought to rejoice. But you see, we, we've got to, uh, we, if we're going to build a family, we're going to have to get back into a family building mode and mindset. And I'm going to tell you, this is as far from the Western mind relative to church as the North Pole is from the South. Let me give you an illustration. Last year in the fall, there was a couple that came here, a businessman and his wife. They invited me to go to lunch with them, and I went. And over lunch, this woman said to me, 
this man's wife, said, Brother Robinson, we wanted you to come to lunch to, with us to see if you would come to our city and pioneer a church. And we, of course, would be very interested in assisting with that. And my husband's a businessman, and, you know, we have uh, these connections and so forth. And, and I said to her, I said, no, ma'am, I, I, I really wouldn't. And she said, well, you answered awfully quick. She said, don't you want to pray about it? And I said, no, ma'am. Uh, I said, uh, I, first of all, I don't feel like God's finished with me at Brownsville. And secondly, if I came to your city and built the church that I would build, you wouldn't be happy with it. And she said, oh, but Brother Robinson, we, we're making a commitment to you right now. And I said, well, let me explain the church that I build and how I build it, and then you, you tell me whether or not you would be happy with it. And she said, okay. I said, if I came to your city, here's what I would do. I would rent me a house with a large living room, and I would ask you and your husband to help me recruit 11 other couples. And we would win them to the Lord, and we would bring them into my living room. And for one year, I would teach us how to be become a family. You would know everything about me. I'd know everything about you. When I said, I'll know everything about you, she almost dropped it. Because, you see, we don't want to know each other because when people get to know us they might not like us we think but that's what families do they know all about one another and they love one another in spite of it and so I said we'd spend a year becoming a family and at the end I said wait I'd receive an offering every meeting once a week we'd receive an offering and we put it in the bank and then at the end of the first year I would send each one of you 12 couples out, and I would tell you to go out and recruit 11 other couples. And I said, ma'am, look at me. If you did not go out and win 11 other couples to the Lord within that year, I would throw you out of the church. Because anybody that's serious about evangelism can win 12 people to the Lord in a year. And if you can't win 12 in a year, you're not serious about evangelism. Well, she was really becoming upset by now. And uh, I said, but wait a minute. That, that, this is not the end of it. I said, and you, would, you would pour into those, 12, those 11 couples what I had poured into you for one year, and you'd receive an offering every week. You'd turn it in, we'd put it in the bank. At the end of two years, we would go rent or buy a facility we could afford. And we wouldn't need much of a facility because we wouldn't have any furniture in there, maybe some bean bags or some folks, but that's about it. We wouldn't have a raised platform because we wouldn't have any performers. They'd be over in a corner somewhere. Instead of demonstrating their skills and their abilities and parading and uh, so forth, they'd be over there somewhere out of sight. And I said, the reason we wouldn't have furniture in there and we'd have good thick carpet is because we'd only have two positions in the church. We'd either be on our feet in praise or on our face in worship. And you don't need a lot of furniture for that. Well, by then, she was absolutely certain that she didn't want me to come anywhere near her state, let alone her city. But I'm going to tell you, friends, if I, if I was going to pioneer a church, that's what I would do. You say, people won't, won't, won't come to a place like that. Oh, yes, they will. There are people out there that are dying. The number one problem in America today, according to a recent survey, is loneliness. Loneliness. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to build a successful church, if you want to do a work for the kingdom of God, pick out the greatest need and meet that need, and people will flock to you. They will. They will. And so that's what we're endeavoring to do. Now, I've got to hurry. I've got five minutes. Look on page 61, because here is... Um, is how we train our workers, the pathway to ministry. We're, we're committed as a staff to the biblical mandate in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. Now, I want to tell you that I do not, I, now let me tell you my interpretation of that, the five-fold ministry gifts. I do not consider those things to be offices. I think we get into very, very deep trouble when we start creating offices. I see these things as functions. 
There are five functions here, and probably most of you ministers function in more than one or two of these. John Kilpatrick functions in all five of them. And most preachers function in more than one. And God says here through Paul that he has given these gifts to the church in order to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Who's going to do the work of the ministry? The saints are going to do the work of the ministry. Do you know why our churches are not succeeding? Number one is because we're not family, and number two, because those of us on staff that are paid people are trying to do all the work. God has raised us up to raise people up to do the work. And so we're taking that very seriously. And so we believe there's a biblical basis for expecting each member of our church to find a place of ministry within this body. And when we take them through membership class, we tell them, you are not coming into this church to sit in the boat and supervise somebody else rowing. You're going to pick up an oar and begin to row right along with everybody else. And um, so, and the implication of that is if you don't row, we'll throw you out without a lifeboat or without a life vest. And so they, they get real interested then in, in, in helping row the boat. The biblical basis upon which this expectation rests is fourfold. First of all, we believe that every believer ought to be a minister. And there, 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 there are scriptures there that will support that. Secondly, we believe every ministry is important. None is more important than others. I'm going to tell you how, imp how important children's ministry is here. Did you know that we have a children's pastor and, and he has an assistant pastor and we're, we're putting another one on? Did you know that Richard Crisco has uh, three other assistants in youth? And then we have these ministers. We have 11 pastors on staff here. We've ma made a significant investment in leadership here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Because we believe that every ministry of the church is important. And we believe that every ministry is dependent on each other, so there are no private kingdoms. And we believe that every believer is gifted. Every believer is gifted. Now, the model, which we have, page 62, the model we have chosen to equip believers is in the form of a baseball diamond. This is not original with us. The Assemblies of God have a We Build People diamond that you can get from Gospel Publishing House in Springfield. Larry Stockstall uses a baseball diamond concept over at Bethany Christian Center, which is a cell-based church in Baton Rouge. And so we simply borrowed some things uh, with their permission, and, and, um, and uh, we designed our own ministry here. And so here's what we have. Down at the bottom, you see those four squares. Those are the four strategies or the four things we do. Intercessory prayer, community outreach, cleansing stream, and grace groups. We want to put ministers, we want to put workers in those ministries. But in order for a person to get into those ministries, here's what they do. First of all, they must be in a cell and become a member of the church. We feel like if a person will not make a commitment of membership to the church, then they will not make a commitment to work in the church. And so we require that they complete membership. The event on first base is we receive them into membership. And we make that a big deal. We do it on Sunday morning. That's an event. To go from first base to second base, they must be in a group and they must complete cleansing stream. And the event on second base is the cleansing stream retreat. In two weeks, we're going to have a cleansing stream retreat here. And uh, we'll have about 800 people in that cleansing stream retreat. It's an event. To get from second base to third base, a person must be in a group and complete discipleship training. In that discipleship training, one of the things we do is we test them for their giftedness. We said over there the biblical basis that every believer was gifted, but the problem is most believers don't know what their gift is. So we test them and we share with them what their gift is, and then on the, the event on third base, we put them in a retreat and we pair them up with people with other giftings and we assign them a project so they can see these gifts function within a group. For instance, we just did a giftings retreat here just a few weeks ago. The, they did. I was in um, Switzerland or Malta or, 
or France one, but they did it. And um, uh, it just so happened that a, a doctor has given us access to a 650-acre farm to be developed into a ministry site for the church. And so uh, I gave them an assignment about giving us uh, some input as to how that farm could be used to complement the ministry here. Could we use it to develop youth camps and children's camps and uh, rehab, rehab camps, uh, uh, family camps, uh, prayer retreat center? Uh, you know, how could we use this? And, and uh, the, it was an eye-opener for those people to sit down in a group with people with different, gr different giftings and work through some of the problems that were involved in that assignment which I gave them, which is a, was a very real assignment. And um, so they got to see how gifts interact with one another. And one of the reasons we misunderstand one another, one of the reasons Christians are so, um, get, get uptight with one another is because we don't understand one another's giftings. Mercy people, mercy people will drive servers up the wall. Because servers want to get things done. Mercy people just want to love on people. Just want to show mercy, you know. My secretary was a super mercy person when I got her. I've about beaten it out of her by now, but, uh, you know, uh, she's getting as hard as a drill sergeant. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Uh, R.L. Berry is our financial officer, and, and uh, Paula, my secretary, she, um, she's getting ready to take some folks up to uh, Albany, Georgia, where I used to pastor to do a cleansing stream, a little cleansing stream retreat up there. And so she wanted the church vans to do that. Well, the policy is that we don't let church vans go out on long trips like that. If uh, some ministry in the church wants to, to go out on long trips like that, they rent vans. We don't let church vans do that. And so uh, Mr. Barry, our financial officer, was in there, and Paula had him nailed down to get the church vans because she didn't want to rent the vans. And I happened to walk in, and, and Mr. Barry was sitting there, and he was sweating bullets because Paula had lost her, her mercy gift, and she had gotten some of my gift over on her. And, uh, I mean, she was putting the needles to him, and he, he was pleading with me. He said, could you explain to her the policy about the church vans? I got the greatest kick out of that because, see, Paula was so gentle and so kind and so good and... and uh, and, you know, these giftings can be affected. And uh, she was putting the needles to Mr. Barry, and you don't do that very often with him, but he was really uncomfortable. Anyway, the giftings retreat. Get from uh, third base to home plate. You must be in a group and complete leadership training. And um, so um, th this is how we train leaders, and then when they cross home plate, they're released to ministry. And, uh, you know, the reason a lot of people resent ministry is because they haven't been trained and equipped to do it. And so we want to we do that. And we understand this is a radical departure from the tra traditional church model. But what we must come to grip with is the fact that God is positioning us to give us the city and raise us up to be the leadership in bringing the nation to prayer. In order to be prepared to fulfill our destiny, we must adjust to new and innovative methods of doing things and hence the need to equip an army of ministers for the work just ahead. And that's what we do. And that's how we do it. And I appreciate your attention. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll see you in just a little while. Mike Brown will be...